Namaskar friends, welcome back to this lecture in the course on engineering psychology. In the last lecture, we were looking at an important aspect of engineering psychology which is called displays. Displays are important because they help project information to the operator and with this information, the operator can then decide what does he want to do in future. So, future action taking is dependent on displays. Displays give two type of information. One, it tells about the state of a system in terms of whether the system is working ok, if the system has some deficiency or is the system requiring some kind of a input. On the other hand, information related to user's feedback is also provided by displays. As an example, if I press the stop button on a printer, this will stop printing of paper. But how does the user know what happens when he presses this stop button? Displays are meant to provide just that information. It will present the user with job cancelled or job terminated as a feedback to the push of that button which the user had completed. Now, these displays are present in a number of forms. We have looked at digital and analog displays, we have looked at static and dynamic displays and we have also looked at a number of factors which control displays. These factors could be in terms of whether the display is conspicuous enough, whether the display can be read properly and understood and where should the display be put. These are some of the information and facts that we discussed in the last class. Now, since this lecture is more about visual displays, in today's lecture, we will discuss about the visual aspect of humans. We will discuss what are the limitations and capabilities of the visual system and how these limitations and capabilities can help in designing better visual displays. Towards the end of the lecture, we will look at two more forms of displays which are tactile display the display which gives you information in terms of vibrations or haptics and the olfactory display which is to do with the smell sense present in humans. So, let us continue on our discussion on displays. Now, the point that we left in the last class was we were looking at navigational and quantitative displays and how legibility and clutter can influence these displays. Since we are looking at mostly visual displays, now is a good time to discuss the human visual system. I will try to very briefly describe the human visual system, so that you have an understanding of what the visual system comprises of and what are the capabilities of this system and what kind of limitations the visual system exhibits and that is the subject matter of this lecture. The visual sensory organ which is available to humans is called the eye. Now, the eye comprises of several parts. It has the cornea which is the outer surface. It has pupil which is just following the cornea. These pupils are controlled by ciliary muscles which extend and contract to regulate the amount of light which is entering the human eye. Then you have the vitreous humor and aqueous humor which are two fluid filled spaces. This is to maintain the eye pressure and to maintain the sparsity of the eye. Following that is the lens 
which refracts and directs incoming light onto the region of the eye which actually helps in processing of information which is called the retina and then we will discuss some features of the retina. So, all in all what we will do is we will start with looking at what is the cornea, we will then discuss something called the pupil, then the lens, the aqueous and vitreous humor which are as I discussed fluid filled spaces and then we will discuss the retina of the eye which is that space which contains photopigments and these photopigments help in con converting light falling on them to electrical current which is then passed on through the optic fiber to the brain. But do not worry what we will do is uh, we will try and understand this in the easiest possible manner. So, starting with the physical properties of light, all vision starts with light and light is a broad spectrum of wavelengths. Now, within this broad spectrum of wavelength there is something called a visible region of the light in which most visions happen and this wavelength of light within which vision is possible is between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. So, as we discussed visible light is a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum on one hand you have the 400 nanometer and the other hand you have the 700 nanometer and on the either sides of these boundaries you have either the ultraviolet and the infrared regions. Now, ultraviolet and infrared regions are the regions of the electromagnetic spectrum which cannot be seen. Certain animals like dogs can uh, hear information and bats can uh, hear information within this region. Also uh, certain animals can feel the electromagnetic spectrum beyond the visible region, but humans are not capable of seeing anything between 0 to 400 nanometer and then after 700 nanometer forward. So, visible light then is uh, that spectrum which humans can see. Now, the eye human eye is sensitive to light within the range of 400 nanometer and 700 nanometer and this light that is perceived by the human eye as we discussed passes through several layers of the human eye starting from the cornea to the pupil to the vitreous humor and aqueous humor then to the lens and from the lens onto the retina. How is light converted into information for the brain and this uh, property of converting the light into something which the brain can understand and register is done by photocells or photopigments present, present in the retina. These photopigments or photoreceptors they get activated when light falls on them and they convert this light into electrical signals which are then carried by the optic fiber to the primary and the secondary visual area. What are photopigments? You have seen those clocks which chime during the day but during the night when there is no light in the room these clocks do not chime, they do not make sound. How is it possible? It is po possible by using something called the photoelectric 
uh, cell or the photoelectric sensor, photovoltaic center, sensor. And what this photoelectric or photovoltaic sensor does is when light does not fall on it, it breaks the circuit which is connected to the chime and the chime will not sound. But when light falls onto it, the circuit is complete because the photovoltaic cell will convert this light into electrical energy which will complete the circuit and once the circuit is completed, you will hear the chime. So, this is how it functions and a similar thing is present in the human eye. As I explained to you, the eye has several layers, starts with the cornea, then you have the pupil, then the, at, uh, the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor and further to th this you have the lens, then the retina. So, what we will do is we will first start discussing these various segments of the eye and look at properties of these segments. We are not concerned with the functionality of these segments as such because we want to look at the limitations and capabilities, what it can do and what these sections cannot do. So, we will very quickly look at those features of these segments. So, the first segment is called the cornea. Now, the cornea is that segment in which the light enters through from the external environment. So, eye receiving the light happens from through the cornea. Cornea has the property of refraction of light, it refracts light and through this property it transmits light into the inner parts of the eye. The cornea has two third optical power, the other one third optical power lies with uh, the lens and what is this optical power that we are defining? Optical power is the ability to bend or refract light. So, the property of bending light so that it falls onto the retina is done mostly by the cornea and so two third times this bending of light or focusing of light onto regions of the retina which then converts this light into electrical signal is done by the cornea. So, this is the property of the cornea of the eye. The next section is called the pupil. Pupil is that part of the eye which closes and opens to regulate the amount of light entering. This is the same thing which becomes active when you enter a very bright room and a very dark room. In the bright room, the pupil closes down and limits the amount of light so that only sufficient light enters the eye because you are in a very bright room. While in a dark theatre, this pupil opens up to enter as much light as possible so that you can see clearly. So, this regulation of how much light enters the human eye is done by the pupil. Now, it has 2 to 8 millimeter diameter, then it controls the amount of light entering the eye as I just said there is dilation of the pupil whether it could be extending or contracting and this extending and contracting property helps in regulating the amount of eye which enters the eye. It has a range of illumination, so this should be noon light. So, the pupil can help see the dimmest star in the sky to looking at the noon light, looking at the sun during the noon, which means that it has a range of functions through which it can make the amount of light entering the eye possible. So, it is so broad that it can on one end help you see a dim star and on the other end it can help you see the noon light also and this function happens because of the control of the pupil. Also it affects the depth of the field. How deeply you see the external environment is also dependent on the pupil by this property of extending and contracting. And one feature of pupil is that it is not only affected by something called light, 
but pupils are also affected by emotional state. When you are too happy, your pupils elongate, when you are too sad, it contracts. Similarly, when you are too worked up, if you have done a lot of cognitive work, if you have done tiresome mental work, the pupil typically responds according to how much work or how much activity you have done. The third part is called the lens. The lens of the eye has one third optical power which means that it can bend light or refract light only one third times. It has a property called accommodation. The accommodation property is basically the changing of the thickness. Now, the lens that you get from your eye doctor, the ophthalmologist and optometrician, they can vary. They will give you different powered lens, but the lens in the eye is fixed. So, how does it change its focal point? How does it change its uh, capacity to look at different depths? And that uh, happens by changing the thickness of the lens. By changing the thickness, you can change the power of this lens. And that property of changing the power of this one fixed lens is called accommodation. So, accommodation is altering the thickness of the lens by changing its shape. So, the change happens and this change in shape happens through something called the ciliary muscles. They help in reshaping or changing the thickness of the lens. Then there is something called changing accommodation can sharpen image. This accommodation or changing of the shape of the lens is an important feature. How is it important? This changing power of the lens can help us focus sharply. Just as your eye power keeps on increasing or decreasing, you visit the ophthalmologist, the eye doctor and this eye doctor then tests your eye and based on what corrective lens needs to be given to you, he gives you a lens assuming that you have some form of uh, visual uh, disparity in seeing things. So, he gives you different lens and what these different lenses whether it is far uh, sighted lens or near sighted lens power plus power or minus power it helps you in seeing things which is either near or far right focusing on those things similar to that is the idea with the lens of the eye it changes its shape and because of this changes in shape which is the term accommodation we will be able to focus sharply on any object. A simple demonstration can help you understand this. Take your hand and take one finger and put it right in front of your nose and then move it out or move it towards yourself. You will see that as it goes outside, the sharpness of this image keeps on blurring, but at a point of time, after a point of time it becomes still sharp. The same finger if you bring it very close to your nose it again loses the sharpness, but after some times you can still see a sharper image. This correction is called accommodation of the lens and through this property, the lens makes sure that you can clearly focus on the finger or clearly see the image of this finger and this is called the accommodation property. Fovea, now we discussed that light enters the eye through the cornea and then moves through several segments and lastly falls onto the retina. The retina of the eye is curved in nature and towards the periphery of this, outer side of this. So, here is my lens, my light enters here from the environment, it refracts and falls on the retina. Now, on the periphery of the retina, I have something called rods. These are specialized cells which can see black and white. They cannot see color and they take a long time to get adapted to. On the center of the retina, I have something called cones and these cones are those specialized cells which can see color and which help you in seeing brighter objects. While rods help you see dimmer objects, 
cones help you see brighter objects. Now, within the center of the retina is a region which has a large number of cones and if light falls onto this, you can see sharper images of things and colorful images of things. You can see a brighter image and a clearer image. This region of the retina which can help you see better images is called the fovea. So, then what is the fovea? Fovea is the slight depression in the retina which is right somewhere near the uh, notch below the center of the retina and this area has a lot of cones and it light falls on this area. It helps you see better, more accurate. Now, it supports high acuity because of the high density of photoreceptors formed here. So, acuity, acuity the word means that how clearly you can distinguish changes in forms and shapes, how clearly you can see changes in objects and changes in patterns. This is called acuity. Now, we will discuss acuity uh, further and why this fovea is giving you clearer vision because the photoreceptors, those cells which convert light energy into electrical energy is highest in the fovea. And then there you have a region in beside the fovea which is called the optic disc. And what is this optic disc? Now, if the photoreceptors convert light energy into electrical energy, this electrical energy has to be carried to the brain through some wires. Wires in terms of the brain are called neurons. So, these wires need to connect to the retina. Retina is the disc where the photoreceptors are and these photoreceptors are assumed that it is connected by small wires. So, there will be a region where the larger wire which carries all these electrical signal to the brain will connect to the retina. This region where the main wire connects to the retina so as to collect all the electrical inputs by various photoreceptors on the retina is called the optic disc. This is the place where you have no photopigments at all and this is also called the blind spot. If you project light on somebody's blind spot, he will not be able to see because there are no photoreceptors, it is only the connection, right. So, the optic disc contains no photoreceptors as we just discussed because it is the connection of the neurons to the retina. So, it cannot contain photoreceptors, it is the connection region and hence it forms something called the blind spot in each eye that observers are not constantly aware of. All those magic tricks that you see where a magician does something and you are not able to see it or not able to pinpoint how this trick was performed, most of the times it is because those acts are done in such a way that light falls onto your photo uh, your blind spot, your optic disc where there are no photoreceptors. So, this is a brief review of the eye and these are the capabilities and limitations of the visual system. Now, our visual system works on something called the duplex method. What is the duplex method? The ability to see under dim light in high illumination conditions due in part to the fact that we have two distinct visual systems. As I just discussed, we can see a dim star and we can also see the noon light, which means that we have to have at least two types of photoreceptors. Now, these two type of photoreceptors are called rods which help us in seeing dim light and the cones which help us in seeing bright light and this type of vision which has 
both the dim light as well as bright light receptors is called the duplex visual system. Let us talk about rods. The rods are roughly 120 million in each retina. So, more number of rods and then the greatest density of the rods are found in the peripheral of the retina as we discussed that if this is my retina and this is the fovea, this is the optic disc where the optic neurons are connected. This region that I am shading contains the rods, it is towards the periphery. One example that rods are in the periphery can be understood by the fact that if objects are placed in dim light and you try to see it with the center of your eye, you will not be able to see them. The best way to see objects which are in dim light is through the periphery of the eye. That happens because rods can see dim light and if something is in dim light, rods will help in seeing it. So, the greatest density of rods are found in the periphery which is in the 20 degree on the retina away from this fovea. Rods help you in performing something called the scotopic vision which is the night vision. So, night in nights the rods are more active and you, you tend to use rods more and it is maximally sensitive at 510 nanometer wavelength of light. As opposed to the rods which can see black and white or dim light, the cones are roughly 6 millions. So, it is a number of times lower than what the rods are. So, 6 million cones are there in the retina and the cones are mostly in the fovea of the retina. Greatest density of the cone is found in the fovea. This is that receptor which helps you in seeing color and this is that receptor which is formed more in the fovea. It does something called phototopic vision which is the day vision helps you in seeing during the daylight and with most accuracies and it is maximally sensitive at 555 nanometer. So, this is the sensitivity of the cones. There is a property of the human eye which is called dark adaptation. So, what does it mean? In very simple words, when you come out of a cinema hall which is totally black it takes some time for you to start seeing objects which are in light. This property of the human eye to adapt to a dark environment and then to a light environment is called dark adaptation. You would have seen that in, in the night you can perform several functions. For example, you can navigate, you can see larger objects and navigate around it. Now, if the eye is receiving no light, how is it possible to navigate? The property of eye to look at minimal lights and help you in navigation by moving around big objects is dark adaptation. So, the adaptation to dim illumination from bright illumination is called dark adaptation and reflects a shift from vision from photo uh, photopic to the scotopic vision. So, moving from bright light to uh, to dark light is dark adaptation. Similarly, the opposite is light uh, adaptation. Now, cones dark adapt very quickly around 5 minutes. Cone takes around 5 minutes to adapt uh, to from uh, dark to light. So, coming out of the cinema hall very quickly you can see, but if you move from brighter light into a cinema hall, it takes some time for you to see and this is called rod based adaptation and this is dark adaptation. So, rod uh, dark adapts more slowly about it takes about 30 minutes. So, after entering a cinema hall, it will take more time for you to start seeing then when moving out of the cinema hall into a brighter surface because cone takes about 5 minutes and rod takes about 30 minutes. There is something called a photochromatic interval. It is the region between the rods and cone curves and it is called the photochromatic interval and represents a range of light intensities where a light is sufficiently intense to be detected by the rod, but too dim to be detected by the cones. So, if I project the visual graph of the cones 
as in what is the activity of the cones across different uh, bands of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, the visual electromagnetic spectrum and then I project it alongside the cones, a region will come where light intensities can be detected by the rods, but cannot be detected by the cones and this region is called the photochromatic interval. So, it is that region where cones cannot detect this light, but rods can right and this small region in the activity map of the cones and rods is called the photochromatic interval. Want to know more about this? There is an associated book which is prescribed for this course, read and there you will un understand. And then there is something called the Purkinje shift, which is a phenomena which is quite often seen. Now, what it says is as illumination levels decline, red color flowers appear darker, whereas blue flowers appear brighter. This relative change in brightness is a direct result of shift from the cones to the rods. When you are shifting from the cones to the rods, the reds become more blacks and the blues become more bright and this shift is called the blue shift is the Perkin G effect, which are considerably more sensitive to short wavelength of light 400 nanometer than long wavelengths of light. So, this shift when moving from cones to rods is called the Perkin G shift, where blue becomes more intense and red becomes more uh, darker. The spectral sensitivity function which we are discussing, now there are three type of cone receptors, there, although rods are of one type, there, there are three different type of cones which is sensitive to the red, blue and green, the RBG cone. We have the short middle and the long wavelength cones, each is maximally sensitive to a different part of the visual spectrum. So, you have the S cone, the R cone and the G cone, uh, I believe these are the cones and these are sensitive to different parts of the visual spectrum, different intensities of light of the visual spectrum. So, they respond to different intensities of light, different colors because it is uh, these three colors which make up all the colors. So, there are three type of cones which are sensitive to which responds to one type of color. Short wavelength cones are more sensitive to light of shorter wavelength than either the middle or long wavelength photoreceptors. So, short wavelength cones and long wavelength cones and middle wavelength cones are there and they respond to three different colors right from the red to the greens to the yellows. Now, the peak sensitivity of the short middle and long wavelength photoreceptors are 420, 434 and 564 nanometers. So, what this particular section talks about is that there are three type of cones and they respond differently to different type of wavelengths of light which produces that particular color when this frequency of light or this wavelength of light falls on that particular cone. Let us now talk about human visual capability. So, up till now we have discussed the human visual system. Let us talk about human visual cap uh, capabilities. First, we will discuss something called the equity, the visual equity and what is it? It is the ability of the eye to resolve details. Equity is minimal separation uh, equity, the size of the smallest feature and gap between parts of an object that can be reported. So, if I draw two objects like this and this, what is the smallest distance between these two regions that you can perceive, so that you can discriminate the two boundaries. This is called equity. What is the smallest difference or gap between two objects that you can see? This is called visual equity. It is generally measured using something called Snell chart, where you have individual letters and objects. So, what is Snell chart? This is the same chart that the uh, optician that you go to or the ophthalmologist gives you. It has various letters written in different rows or different sizes and what the ophthalmologist asks you is to read this. There will be a point of time after which you cannot be able to distinguish between different letters in a row. So, bigger to smaller to smaller to further smaller this kind of a thing 
and you have to read each of this line at a point of time it will come if you have bad eyes at some row you will not be able to discriminate this row will tell you a visual equity or this row will tell you what kind of power you should be using now how is then uh, this power identified the power or uh, is dependent on visual equity and it is measured in terms of performance of the person in question to a normal observer generally a 20 is to 15 power power is measured in terms of ratio so 20 into 15 power is more accurate here 20 is the ability of the person in question to differentiate clearly between two objects at what length somebody can differentiate between two objects clearly so 20 feet is your performance and the 15 that you get here is the performance of a normal observer people are happy having a 20 20 i which means that your what at what distance you can uh, differentiate should be similar to the normal observer or a standard observer right so 15 feet is the standard observer and your is 20 feet if you have a power of 20 40 which means that the normal observer can distinguish two objects at 40 feet whereas you can do it only at 20 feet and so you need your power needs to be changed right so this is how power is exactly measured and visual equity is an important part in terms of designing visual signs in time and, and visual displays the next feature of the human visual system has to do with something called illumination and equity now we have just looked at ac the fact that equity is the distance that you can smallest distance that you can discriminate between two different objects the smallest gap that you can discriminate between two objects so that now you can differentiate the boundary between them now is this property of discrimination affected by illumination does how bright a display is has anything to do with how efficiently you can discriminate two different displays let us look at that so changes in uh, the quality of vision as illumination reduces what it says that this property of distinguishing gap between two objects or the minimum gap that separates two objects is dependent on illumination the more illuminated a surface is an environment is the higher the chance that you can discriminate the border between two objects but if lower level of illumination is present then this kind of discrimination is not possible this is the same reason why in a dark environment if you have smaller objects navigation becomes difficult but when you are navigating around your house you can very easily walk across barriers like big chairs and tables but smaller objects create problems the reason being that with dim light distinguishing of gaps between objects or distinguishing of clarity between two objects becomes difficult where does it help this helps in the design of signs where should a sign be placed what kind of illumination the sign should have and what kind of letters should be written how they should be written all these properties or all these factors influence the design of signs similarly of warnings and labels also depend on equity for example if i have a sign on the road and these signs are meant to be for operational traffic now road signs undergo a lot of weather conditions it could be dark it could be rainy it could be so many other environment problems and these problems can degrade the readability of this sign so sign designers or display designers should keep in mind how to make this sign illuminated 
you can use probably some kind of a motion some kind of artificial motion by using uh, artificial motions in terms of uh, illusions you can create lines in such a way that it it shows motion so a sign could have this kind of a lining which or uh, if you have seen uh, illusions which create virtual movements this kind of factors can be used and by using this motion as we have read before this will help in the perception of the sign even in poor environments we could also use color and we can also use different textures for designing signs in such a way that people even if they are driving in poor environments they will be able to notice the warning label and warning sign another important property of the human visual system has to do with acuity and eccentricity eccentricity is where is something centered eyes are curved in nature and rods and cones are as a function of position of the retina the uh, acuity of rods and cones varies why it varies is first reason is that the eye is curved and the rods and cones are placed in different intensities in different ratios around this curve region visual acuity is greatest at fovea and decreases rapidly as we move away as we move away we have more rods and so we have just seen that acuity is dependent on something called illumination now the fovea is the region where we have more cones and this is the region which is the brightest so acuity will be highest here but if you move away from this region then you will only see rods here and these rods work in poor illumination or lower illumination and so acuity will fall acuity is half at 5 to 6 degree visual angle from the fovea so if you move away 5 to 6 degrees from the fovea on either side you will lose acuity also fixating on the target is dependent on where the light is being focused at the periphery of the retina focusing is difficult fixating the target becomes difficult but at the fovea it is easy however if a target is in dim light fixating it uh, becomes easier at the periphery because the periphery has more rods and so they will be highly active but focusing it on the retina becomes difficult at the fovea the fovea can not see or cannot uh, display higher acuity at brighter illumination one way of improving acuity of objects in dim environments is creating size increasing the size of the object we saw that if objects are huge in size or bigger in size then rods can discriminate them at some level so this is one feature another interesting thing to look at is to do with something called acuity and contrast what is contrast contrast is a ratio of how bright my foreground is against the background if my foreground is sufficiently brighter than the background it sorts of jumps out of the screen but if it is sufficiently lower than the background then it tends to fade away in the screen so this ratio has to be balanced the luminance of the foreground and background and this is called contrast now does people's ability to discriminate between two objects vary as a function of contrast is what we need to understand compensates diminished activity if peripheral vision is to make peripheral stimulus large so yes if you want to look at objects in dimmer light or if you want to use peripheral vision one way to improve your acuity is to make this objects bigger in size we just discussed this a moment ago now increasing the size and spacing between letters we can increase legibility 
if we not only want to use the fovea but also the periphery of the vision the whole of eye in seeing one way to do that is increasing the letter spacing increasing the size of the letters and if we do that it will help us in understanding with more clarity what is being written and this can only happen if we can distinguish the spacing between letters if you can read the letters better we will be able to extract meaning and understand what the sign is saying us right so increasing the legibility legibility of a letter depends upon the size another important thing to be looked at is a reduction in contrast can reduce acuity if the foreground and background are having nearly similar or very few differences in terms of the brightness or luminosity then acuity or the property of humans to look at gaps or distinguish two objects or letters becomes difficult so contrast certain amount of contrast is required for humans to function properly and distinguish between two objects or two letters use of color again aids helps in designing of displays and designing of information projection systems how does color help colors help us in segregation of a target from the background using brighter colors and lighter colors is a way of using contrast to distinguish between what is to be read and what is to be eliminated black on wh white background golden on black these are some of the ways of improving or segregating target from background colors can help in grouping some objects of similar color will be grouped together and objects with some other color will be grouped together so parts of background and parts of foreground can then be put in different colors and people can then group what is the foreground and the background signaling properties of objects an object in red would suggest that you should not touch it and an object in green should suggest that you can work with it so signaling properties of object as to press something not press something or do something with it can also be enhanced by using colors signal identity you have seen football matches in which a particular team wears a particular color and that displays every member of the team so it tells you who are the pro, uh, people in that team and who are the people in some other team and they are grouped together or they are part of this team is expressed by this color now signals different functional states red green and yellow signals different functional say, uh, state for example red says stop no go green says go and yellow says that move with caution and this is used in your traffic light so this kind of color system can be used for describing different functional states of a system which can then be perceived by people and interpreted it for taking further action uh, there is a section on color blindness which will uh, avoid it's not that important we'll very quickly go through this so there is something called a uh, dichromatism where observers is missing the long middle and short wavelengths and there are three forms of it one is called the proto uh, protonopia which is missing the long wavelength cone the deutonopia which is missing the middle wavelength cone and then you have the tritonopia which is missing the short wavelength cone so if you miss one of these cones you will not be able to see that particular color and a contrast color so red with some other color uh, these cones are uh, having a dual end sens uh, sensitivity which means that if one end becomes too sensitive the other color that you start seeing this is called the color after effect for example if you see red and then you uh, after seeing this red if you focus on a white screen then a contrasting color will be visible to you this is called uh, a, a theory in color vision which says that an alternating color uh, will be sensitive this is called the color after effect so if you miss one of these cones that particular color you will not be able to see disturbances of color discrimination so protonopia and deutonopia impairs red green color discrimination whereas the tritonopia impairs the 
blue yellow color discrimination so if you miss one of these this kind of color discriminations can happen anomalous trichromats have three cones but the spectral sensitivity of one of these cones is different than the normal observers and so what happens is one cones bec becomes more active and because of that colors in that particular wavelength is perceived more than some other wavelength now we come to something called size and distance perception does the perception of different distance uh, gets affected by size in terms of how big something is does it actually leads to distance perception so all in all what we are trying to see here is that whether humans can get affected by size in terms of perception and the fact that how humans perceive 3D. Now, the ability to move through our environment effortlessly and to interact with objects that share that space depends on our perception of depth. So, depth perception how is the 2D eye creating depth that is uh, what I am trying to explain here. Depth information also supports motor behavior allowing you to grab an object and place in a particular location. So, why do we need depth? Because grasping anything into the environment grasping anything from the environment or interacting with things in the environment require you to know where exactly in the environment is that object. So, you have to reach it through the eye and so that perception is necessary. Now, this there are two types of distance measurements one is called the ego dis, egocentric distance in terms of which people look at how far something is in terms of how far that thing is from themselves. So, this is one way of measuring depth which is in terms of egocentric distance how far is something from me or people also use something called relative depth how is object A different from object B in terms of distance. So, how far is A from B that is called relative. So, two objects A and B how far they are if this is the calculation that I am doing I am using relative depth but how is far is A from me is what is called egocentric depth and both these type of informations are used by people for measuring depth. Now, there are several cues signals that people use in terms of measuring depth there are, are a set of cues which are called static cues occultion occultion is occluding or hiding something if an object is hiding some other object and if the part of the second object is visible we believe that the second object is bigger than the first objects so if two buildings are there if two buildings are there and one building is shading part of the uh, other building then we can believe that the second building is bigger than the first building because this first building is half of the second building or it is uh, shadowing off or it is cutting off part of the second building. Size compare two objects on 2D space for example, look at this we believe that this object is bigger than this object or this object is nearer to you. So, if I draw a line like this and if I draw two objects like this then this size of comparative size of these two arrows will tell you how far they are in the environment. Texture gradient texture of a particular environment also lets you perceive distance as we move further away objects which are textured for example, cobblestones they lose their boundaries they become clubbed together and so this clubbing of objects of the environment which we know what size they are if they appear to be clubbed together we believe that they are distance from us. So, this is called texture gradient parallel lines converging to distance linear perspective if these kind of lines are present in a picture or these kind of lines which go inside the picture are present they suggest that there is a depth in the picture or objects which are at the far end of the line then in the near end of the line are away from you this is called a linear perspective atmospheric perspective distance objects have reduced contrast. So, if something is having lower contrast appears less brighter than something which is more brighter we believe that objects which are less brighter is happening because of scattering of light and because of that they are far away from us and position related to the horizon in most objects in the environment we first look at the horizon and in comparison to the horizon how far or how big something is will tell you how far they are so, objects which are very near to the horizon which appear to be smaller and very uh, near to the horizon appears to be further away than objects which are uh, very close to the horizon. 
there are some kind of dynamic cues that people use and what is this dynamic cues there is something called motion parallax the idea is that if you have ever traveled in a car you find that objects which are near to you travel faster than objects which are further away from you and this is called motion parallax the other thing is that uh, beyond a in a uh, fixation point that you are looking so you, when you look at objects you have a fixation point you fixate at something now objects which are further away from the fixation point move in your direction and objects which are more closer than this fixation point moves in the opposite direction and this property of movement suggests that objects are further or uh, nearer to you there are some kind of a kinesthetic cues which uh, are used in perceiving depth now as an object approaches the comparative state of the eye and lens must change to maintain a clear image on the retina and the eyes rotate inward so if something comes close to you the uh, lens of the eye it manages its accommodation it changes its accommodation to uh, increase its power so that you can focus sharply on this object so this is one cue so the more bend that the eye uh, does it will create a muscle tension on the ciliary muscle and this muscle tension then will be interpreted by the eye in terms of how closer or further something is this is a internal uh, mechanism for perceiving motion now muscle tension offers cues about distance because the magnitude of the tension is related to the distance of the object that there is uh, and more angling with closer objects so if something is more closer to you the lens becomes shorter and if it is further away from you the lens become elongated and this motion that is happening the ciliary muscles so this is my lens this is the ciliary muscle the more it bends the ciliary muscle has to come more uh, together and this will create a tension and this tension is then interpreted by the brain in terms of distance and there is something called the binocular cue which is uh, one uh, feature of this binocular cue is called the stereopsis a very simple ex uh, experiment to demonstrate it if you have take your finger put it in front of you and then see it with the left eye first with the right eye closed and then see it with the right eye first and then the left eye closed you will see that it is moving it appears at different distances there is a relative shift and this basically also helps you in looking at or understanding depth now perception of relative depth that is perceived by slightly different views of the world perceived by the two lateral eyes take your hand point a finger put it in front of your nose and uh, look at it uh, first by one eye then the other eye and when you are doing this close the alternate eye when you see the position of this finger will shift relatively and this is basically the binocular cue now does illumination affect distance and depth perception there are three type of spaces uh, that people have and they are affected differently by illumination so we have personal space which is immediately surrounding to an individual here convergence and accommodation cues are the only which are, which are effective for 10 meters around you are affected by accommodation and convergence which is the property of the lens to bend action spaces so different spaces around us are affected by different cues that is what we are listing here personal spaces within 10 meters are affected by properties of the lens to bend action space is a region which is around 30 meters occlusion height and visual field uh, binocular disparity motion perspective and relative size are the cues which are helpful at this region and beyond 30 meters occlusion and relative size uh, are the ones uh, which are more used for perceiving depth Elimination, the effect, uh, the effectiveness of many of the depth cues are compromised by low elimination. So, if the elimination level goes down, uh, the effectiveness of perceiving these cues also goes down. So, that is an end to the visual uh, display. Uh, there are two displays we will very quickly look at. One is called the tactile display. This has to do with the touch sensation. So, if it is always used in supplement to the visual and auditory information. So, tactile display only works with uh, the uh, visual and auditory display same thing as in the vibration of your phone so vibration of the phone is uh, an additional information that the call is coming and it works with you looking at the phone to understand what is happening right so this feedback that you get from the phone is a tactile display there is only one situation in which the tactile display works alone and that is called the braille in braille in the braille 
people have no eyesight and just by touching the braille surface they know what is written and in those cases only the tactile display works alone most cases it uses the visual and auditory information now tactile cues often serve as an electric function for example the vibration of the phone or the rumble strip so rumble strip tells you that you have to slow down uh, your vehicle or the vibration of the phone tells you that something is uh, some kind of alert has arrived at your phone there are two types of cues within the tactile display we have something called the kinesthetic cues and the proprioceptive cues receptors found in the muscles and joints provide two types of cues what are the kinesthetic cues of tactile displays they provide information that allows you to sense that your body and limbs are moving so when your body and limbs move there is a cueing system inside the body which tells you that a uh, part of your body has moved or it gives you some kind of an information as in your body has moved and this tells you through the tactile display or through the tactile system that pressure system that something has moved or some kind of movement has happened. There is a proprioceptive cues in which perception of the static position of the body and limbs in space uh, happen. For example, in using these cues you tend to know that your legs where are your legs and whether it is on the brake paddle or not, where is your hand and where is it this hand is and this kind of information can then be integrated in terms of understanding what is happening in the environment. Text, tactile receptors, there are three types of receptors, these are all nerve endings, some, some of them are free nerve endings, some of them are uh, capsulated nerve endings. So, we have the Merkel disc which is disc which are located close to the surface of the screen, we have the Messner corp, uh, corpuscles which are located close to the surface of the uh, uh, skin and the Penikian corpuscles, these three type of uh, which are found in deeper in the skin, these three type of receptors help in give, getting tactile display or uh, display related to pressure. Now, adaptation refers to how quickly a receptor st uh, stops responding even if the stimulus is maintained. Adaptation is a property through which people stop responding to uh, stimuluses. For example, think about a room which has a uh, clock in it and this clock is ticking. Now, as you enter the room for the first time you will hear this clock ticking but over a period of time this ticking will disappear although the clock is there you are there but you will no, no longer hear this clock. This property is called adaptation and adaptation is a property of your uh, nervous system to avoid over indulgence or to avoid uh, over excitation of a particular system. Tactile sensitivity, tactile sen sensitivity is greatest at the fingertips, thumbs and areas of the face including the lips, cheeks, uh, cheeks and nose and females are more sensitive to passive pressure than males. Now, two points discrimination threshold, you would have seen three point touch, four point touch on screens. So, two point where two different pressure sensations or two different uh, objects which are cre uh, creating pressure where it is more sensitive are best in fingertips, nose, lips and cheeks and the poorest in the upper arm, calf, thighs and back. So, if two objects or two hands are touching it, uh, you, these are the uh, areas where you will be able to perceive it best and these are the areas where you will be able to perceive it the worst. Active versus passive touch, active touch involves ex ac active exploratory movements by the actors and that the discriminative ability are enhanced through ex active exploration. Then when support superior object recognition and passive touch is the passive pressing of an object and these factors help in developing something called haptics. So, uh, active, active touch is more about exploration, active exploration and passive touch is passively touching something. The last kind of display that we have is called olfactory display. So, the smell system of our body also help us in uh, discriminating objects or in displaying certain information, certain states of information. A good example is natural gas. So, when gas leaks, the cooking gas leaks, you get a pungent smell and this pungent smell is not the smell of the gas per se, but it is a chemical which is added to that particular gas which is called mercaptan. So, this kind of uh, using the order system for uh, presenting some kind of warning is called olfactory display. So, olfactory stimuli can elicit compelling detailed memories. You would see that the freshly baked bread from an oven or a particular smell from your childhood, they elicit certain memories and if that smell comes back again at some point of time, that memories are elicited. So, olfactory senses are the uh, most active senses 
and uh, the most compelling sense which gives you detailed memories. Now, means of increasing the degree of immersion an operator experiences when interacting with virtual environments is through olfactory senses. Two examples of using the olfactory uh, sense as a display system is Sensorema. This was a game uh, way back in the uh, late 2000s uh, where uh, you had this whole uh, bike riding in New York kind of a setup where people were made to sit in a box and uh, all kind of smells and all kind of uh, uh, smell related features in uh, addition to holding the bike handle and moving through those streets of New York. That kind of virtual environment was given and people enjoyed that. So, Sensorema was a game which used this or you can also talk about Disney World where some uh, sometimes this Disney World uses certain kind of smells to uh, give that fragrances that you are in a hypothetical world in a dream world. And so, Disney uses this kind of a thing and this olfaction gives detailed memory or tries to create certain kind of experiences. Mercaptan we actually uh, we just talked about how this is added into the natural gas to smell the leaking and oil of wintergreen is used in fire extinguishers to uh, suggest the presence of carbon dioxide gas. Now, lastly we look at the limitation of the olfactory system if it is a good system then why do not we use it too often. There are several problems first we quickly become desensitized to odors. So, if you are buying perfume for example, now only if you start putting your perfume onto the palm after two or three perfumes you will not be able to distinguish uh, these perfumes. This happens because the olfactory nerve is the largest nerve and it bypasses the thalamus and because of that it can only carry limited information and because of that uh, the, it is uh, not able to make distinguishing between many stimuli or many form of stimuli and that is one reason we cannot use olfactory displays uh, where distinguishing has to be done between many uh, objects or many type of objects and the second is distraction caused by active dispersal of odorant using puffs or air and fans. Think about a situation when there is a, a perfume which is uh, dispersed onto you on your face, we do like it. Now, this kind of uh, problem is there. So, dispersion of this perfume, dispersion of this odors uh, related substances takes time and it tends to concentrate in some place and uh, uh, in some other places it is devoid of and these are uh, uh, basically dependent on how is the air flowing and because of that this kind of display or this kind of system cannot be used for uh, warning system or for creating labels. So, uh, in today's section what we did was we looked at the visual system and further to that we looked at the capabilities and limitations of the human visual, visual system. We looked at how the properties of the human visual system helps us in designing displays and what all can be learned from it. We looked at tactile displays of how, what are tactile displays and what are the benefits of these displays and uh, how we can use them in creating warning signs and labels and display systems. And lastly, we looked at olfactory displays and how these olfactory displays help us in uh, creating active displays or active warning sign displaying system. For this class, we will end it here. Thank you for being here. Namaskar and goodbye from the MOOC studio.